Hello, welcome back to Wednesday Word. Thank you for joining me. This time, we're going to return to our brand new study of the book of Malachi. We just got started last week, spent a good amount of time looking at introductory materials, some overview facts about the book, and then quickly went into chapter one. And it only took one verse for us to notice immediately that these minor prophet books do not at all begin as we are accustomed to from studying perhaps Paul's letters in the New Testament, some of the things that we've looked at recently. I mean, from the very beginning, we see there's no salutation, no greeting, no wish for grace, mercy, or any of those nice things. It just simply dives into content that we are told very specifically comes directly from the Lord for the target audience of his people. In fact, when we looked at verse one, we noted that some versions say it's the oracle of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi, and some others say it's the burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. We noted that probably the heaviness of the content would have been very burdensome to Malachi, would have been a weight that he carried, a burden for his people, for the sin his people had slid into. So we saw quickly that using an interesting back and forth method that was accentuated and motivated, almost driven by some questions, about 23 of them, at least 10 of them blatantly rhetorical questions because they're so ridiculous they don't even deserve an answer. But we saw that format develop very quickly in this book. There's no doubt the passion of these people for God had totally waned. It was sad to see how far away from God they had slid. The commitment to him was weak at best, non-existent at worst. We looked at the fact that by verse two, we've already gone into that format relying on questions. And it's pitiful because the people of God were actually questioning his love for them. In fact, so much so that God begins by affirming his love for them and assures them that he loves them. And it's a blatant first person statement. And what's really interesting is that affirmation of God's love becomes the backdrop for the literal, I, I hate to say it, but rebukes, exhortation, um, almost judgmental statements that God is going to make regarding his people as we saw that last time. Because the people doubted that he loved them, he has to prove something that should go without saying. They had had some difficult times, some challenges because of their disobedience that just affirmed more more, more surely, I guess, to them. He must not love us without realizing that living in disobedience was creating some of the distress that they faced. How often we do the same thing. We don't realize that our own bad choices create negative circumstances that make our situation worse. So <laughs> the people say, so God says, I've, I love you. I have loved you. Don't, can't you see I love you? And their response is, how have you loved us? That is pitiful. So in reply to that, he goes into an interesting historical fact to verify his love for them. He cites the fact that he, of his own free will, chose Jacob as the head of a lineage that would be the people of God. What's really interesting is uh, Jacob didn't deserve to be chosen. God just chose him. And he cites the fact that he chose Jacob instead of Esau. 
Even though we spoke about it a little bit last time, I, I will at least remind you that God wasn't just arbitrarily being mean to Esau. There were things in Esau's heart that God knew. First of all, he didn't even value his birthright. Secondly, he didn't have enough commitment to God to marry godly women. He married pagan women, women who worshiped idols, and three of them at that. So when the Bible says here in the book of Malachi and also in the book of Romans that God rejected Esau, that he chose Jacob, that he, in fact, most versions say he hated Esau. It does not mean that he doomed Esau to eternal damnation. It means that he arbitrarily of his own free will chose Jacob, although we know there were some circumstances in Esau's heart that definitely did contribute to that. Now, Jacob's descendants were chosen on purpose as a part of God's plan. There was, without doubt, a ministry purpose there. He intended that lineage to be the lineage through which Jesus Christ would be born. And in that process, he made Esau the subordinate of his brother Jacob. Now, that sounds unfair according to the culture of that day because the older son should have inherited two-thirds of everything. But God had a plan. He had an agenda. Jacob would inherit the covenant promises that were originally made to Abraham and then to Isaac and then passed on down. Again, I repeat, God's plan did not ultimately, deliberately, purposefully exclude Esau. There were some choices that would be up to Esau and his descendants. And as unfortunate as it is, those descendants of Esau did not make good choices and ended up reaping the results of those choices because God initially gave them good land. It was his desire that they would serve him, that they would ultimately be blessed, not like Jacob, but blessed, and they had a choice. But down through history, they were antagonistic toward Israel, toward the descendants of Jacob. Ultimately, we know that their land was laid waste, probably by the Babylonians, most certainly by the Nabataean Arabs, and ultimately they were indeed driven from the land and it was left desolate. Now, God's logic is, if you would just think, as my people, if you would just think about this, think about the blessings that you are now enjoying. Yes, you went off into Babylonian captivity. Yes, you have come back as a post-exile small group, a, a remnant, if you would have it that way. But the land is being rebuilt. The temple has been rebuilt. The sacrifices have been restored. I mean, Nehemiah came back a long time ago, built the walls. Uh, the decree was made to rebuild the temple. You have blessings. Don't you see that you have blessings? And the land that was given to Esau, they were run off that land. That, that land is desolate. Can't you see the loving and gracious care of God? Yes, there is correction because of disobedience, but as a backdrop to all of that, as I said, as we began reviewing this, this content that we covered last time, the backdrop is always God's love. His choices are ultimately intended for the good of those he loves. To the point that they should have seen God's goodness, not only in the land of Israel, but spreading beyond the borders of Israel. The focus of the text after the discussion of whether or not God loves his people shifted to the priests, to the fact that the priesthood was corrupt. In fact, I told you last time that the priest in Malachi's day followed the ways of Nadab and Abihu and the sons of Eli more than they did Levi and those original priests that served. 
Even though they were administrators of the Mosaic Covenant, their hearts were far from God. In other words, they were doing stuff, I'm going to use the word stuff, that looked religious, but their hearts were not turned to and devoted to God. So that's the kind of priest that Malachi addresses. They were basically, I, I want to say, I want to be nice and say maybe backslidden, but some would argue they were apostates. In fact, their disregard of God's law, their failure to honor him was so pronounced that it was almost impossible for any kind of influence to come from them other than a very negative influence that would undermine true faith, righteous conduct, sincere obedience to the law and to the God of the law. Now, that basically is just a quick overview of where we are. And I want to go back now to our text. We are in Malachi chapter 1. Yes, it's a short book, but it is jam-packed with things that, as I said last time, are very applicable for us today. So I want to start our reading at chapter 1. And we'll begin at verse 6. And it says, A son honors his father, and a servant his master. If then I am the father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my reverence? Says the Lord of hosts. To you priests who despise my name, yet you say, In what way have we despised your name? Notice those argumentative almost questions. You offer defiled food on my altar, but say, in what way have we defiled you? By saying the table of the Lord is contemptible. And when you offer the blind as a sacrifice, is it not evil? And when you offer the lame and sick, is it not evil? Offer it then to your governor, would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you favorably, says the Lord of hosts? But now entreat God's favor, that he may be gracious to us. While this is being done by your hands, will he accept you favorably, says the Lord of hosts? Who is there even among you who would shut the doors so that you would not kindle fire on my altar in vain? I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts, nor will I accept an offering from your hands. For from the rising of the sun, even to its going down, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. In every place, incense shall be offered to my name and a pure offering. For my name shall be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. But you profane it, in that you say the table of the Lord is defiled and its fruit, its food is contemptible. You say, oh, what a weariness, and you sneer at it, says the Lord of hosts, and you bring the stolen, the lame, and the sick. Thus you bring an offering. Should I accept this from your hand, says the Lord? Oh, my. Now, the questions that actually introduce the content of verse 6 immediately reveal condemnation of the priest, and it's in somewhat of a parallel Hebrew form. God is, there's no other, no other way to say it, God is angry with the priest because of their arrogant, open contempt for the law and their negative use of the power of influence. So God says, um, you honor your father, you honor your master. Where's my honor? As the ultimate father and the ultimate master. Now, it goes without saying that honor is due our sovereign God. In other words, if we honor and respect earthly fathers and masters, if they're entitled to that respect, shouldn't more honor go to God? 
the priests were acting as if God didn't even exist. And they certainly didn't show any fear or reverence for him. So Malachi blatantly, overtly confronts these priests, these so-called spiritual leaders, because they were not representing God. They were not being obedient to God. They were not serving God. In fact, they were showing him zero respect. Some versions go so far as to say the priests despised God. I'm not sure what you read at home, but it's interesting what the wording is sometimes. The priests were blatantly hypocrites, pretending to be pious, but simply going through altar rituals without any heed to either the letter of or the spirit of the law. Notice the question, the rebuttal question of the priests. How have we despised your name? What have we done that's wrong? The open contempt that they show for the sacrificial requirements clearly spelled out in the law was literally a, a disgrace. It was a, degrade, a disgrace to our loving and caring Lord. It was a disgrace to their role as a priest. It ignored the requirements set forth in the law. Here's what was happening. Did you notice the reference to blind and crippled and the sacrifices that are being offered on the altar of the temple are crippled and diseased and maimed and flawed. Sacrifices totally unbecoming, totally inappropriate to what would have been acceptable even to often to offer to a human being of some position of influence and power. Did you notice the reference? Would you offer that to a governor, a, a human being in a position of rulership over you? Would you give him something so inferior and then expect him to show favor to you? Well, if we certainly wouldn't give it to a human being, his logic is then how on earth would my people offer something like that to the God of the universe? How could the priests and the people believe that God would find that kind of sacrifice acceptable? And here's what's ridiculous. That kind of sacrifice that's inferior, unacceptable, didn't meet the criteria of the law, would be offered, and then the priests and the people would ask for and expect to receive some sort of favor from God. That's strange, isn't it? And so God asks not once but twice if those inferior sacrifices, aren't they evil? Because there was no sincerity in that kind of action. God's law clearly required unblemished sacrifices. Remember in the day of Jesus, the priests were cheating the people saying, ooh, there's a blemish right here on your sacrifice. You'll have to go over there and buy one that's not blemished. It's amazing how down through history, the priests twisted things according to the law, supposedly, for their benefit. So the criteria is made very clear in the law. Let's just look at Leviticus 22, 22. Those that are blind, fractured, maimed, or have a wart, a festering rash, or, a, or a scabs you shall not offer to the Lord, nor make of them an offering by fire on the altar of the Lord. There couldn't be a little scratch on the sacrifice. It had to be perfect. Now, there is a suggestion, if you read carefully and look at the language, that an inferior or polluted sacrifice was the equivalent of polluting God himself. The priests were irreverent, showed nothing but contempt for the things that were sacred. They were demeaning God that is the kindest thing that we can say. Now, truthfully, even as believers, followers of the Lord, of, of, of Jesus Christ, 
having been saved through Christ and having now a relationship with God, shouldn't we also give God our best? I mean, we shouldn't use our best resources, our best talents, our best energy, our our dominant time, all those things to satisfy our own desires and selfish pleasures and then give God whatever is left, uh, the leftovers, the residual. In fact, Paul makes it clear when he writes to the Romans that our entire lives are to be a living sacrifice to God, the kind that's holy and acceptable, so it shouldn't be flawed and it shouldn't be the leftovers. We know what Romans 12, 1 says. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to do what? To present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Now, verse 9 is ironic. There's no other way to say it because it would do these people absolutely no good to beg God for favor because God is not going to accept those sacrifices or hear those prayers from someone who's overtly and blatantly dishonoring him. Now, it's a sad truth that when political leaders or spiritual leaders are not righteous, all the people mourn and suffer. But here, we have to go ahead and say that a heavy load of guilt belongs on these priests. The people are not exempt. They're responsible for their choices. But these priests are leading the people astray. Verse 10 is interesting. Let me go back and reread verse 10. Who is there even among you who would shut the doors so that you would not kindle fire on my altar in vain? Do you know what he's saying? He's saying, I wish, I plead for someone to just close the temple because no worship would be preferable to contemptible worship, worship that does not honor me, worship that is not acceptable. God makes it clear that he has zero pleasure and will basically not accept offerings that are so-called that kind of worship. He didn't want their worthless sacrifices. He didn't want sacrifices that were inferior offered by Jewish priests who were not right in their hearts because his very greatness, the very majesty of God would make those sacrifices unacceptable. How could you offer something so inferior to a God who is so amazing? So he says, look, I have no pleasure in that. I won't accept that from your hands. I do not want that. It is worthless. But ultimately, True worship, true thanksgiving, true praise and adoration will be offered to me. And if it's not that kind, that worship is vain. Now, he, he does mention pure offerings and a suggestion of incense or sacrifices from people around the world would eventually come to him. There's even that phrase from the rising of the sun even to its going down in verse 11, meaning that everywhere and at all time, at some point, the Lord is going to receive praise that is the right kind of worship. And he wants that, he prefers that, he expects that. <clears throat> of course, we know that the full, complete fulfillment of that will, will only be referred when we move over into the new covenant and the Gentiles receive Christ in their hearts. And then even as we see today, when the gospel message is being spread around the world. Now, the idea here is not suggesting that once Gentiles begin to worship the true God, that they're going to adapt the Mosaic sacrificial offering system. That's not what's being suggested, that there will be animals killed all over the world in every nation. But more than 
that it's somewhat of a suggestion of pure worship in a way these people would understand. Psalm 141 verse 2 says, May my prayer be counted as incense before you, the raising of my hands as the evening offering. So see these parallels of comparing the sacrificial worship system to the fruit of our lips, the raising of our hands, the ways that we demonstrate worship today, and most importantly, when our life is a sacrifice of worship. Hebrews 13, 15. Through him then, let's continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God, that is the fruit of lips praising his name, as I mentioned. So Malachi's actually predicting here or foretelling here a time when people from all over the world would worship the Lord from their hearts as the only true God. And we know that even as we increase and see more and more people believe on the Lord Jesus Christ around the world, one day Jesus is going to rule and reign. And one day every knee is going to bow to him. I'd a whole lot rather bow by submissing, submission of my will today than be forced to bow one day because I rejected him. So many scriptures talk about this idea of God being acknowledged over the world. Can't read them all. Isaiah 45, 22 to 25. Isaiah 49, 5 to 7. Let me just read Isaiah 59 and verse 59. So they will fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. Hear the similar language. For he will come like a rushing stream which the wind of the Lord drives. Now, the God of Israel, the same God we know, would be known. He will be worshipped. His power would be recognized around the world. Malachi makes that clear, and we know that lines up and is in agreement with the whole of Scripture. And we do see that we have a role in making that prophetic statement come true because even when we support a missionary or we share our testimony or we give an offering or we help with a project, we are in essence playing a role in making God known around the world. So when we get involved in our local church's missions projects, when we participate to whatever level we are, are allowed to, or when maybe God for some places a call on their lives to go to an inner city or to go to a foreign field or to go to a, a an area where the gospel has not been spread, we're all playing a role in helping that to be the truth. Now, verse 12 refers back to polluted sacrificial offerings. And there's a connection between verse 7 and verse 12. Let's glance back at that for just a second. Let me look at verse 7. And it says, you, off, you offer defiled food on my altar. Now, he, he's not saying food to eat. He means the sacrifices. But say, in what way have we defiled you? By saying the table of the Lord is contemptible. And then look at verse 12. But you profane it. And that you say the table of the Lord is defiled and its fruit, its food is contemptible. Now he's repeating himself here because he's accenting again the fact that inappropriate sacrifices are being offered. Not only are the sacrifices inappropriate, not only are the hearts of the priests wrong, not only should they not even be willing to offer that kind of sacrifice, the whole attitude of the priest toward the temple service is wrong. They view it as burdensome. Did you notice the beginning of verse 13? You also say, oh, what a weariness, and you sneer at it. Oh, my goodness. They literally find their service in the temple to offer sacrifices and to do the duties assigned to them. They find that those duties burdensome, distasteful, wearying. 
They literally treat it with contempt. Notice that word sneer. Some other versions use other words, but all of them are very derogatory. There's an indication that the whole attitude of the priest, their very demeanor is completely inappropriate. So Malachi has returned to how pitiful the whole process is. The sacrifices that are offered, there is even a suggestion, if you read very closely, that the people are offering sacrifices that have been taken from predatory animals who were trying to drag them away or consume them so that those sacrifices might even be maimed and partially eaten by an animal, torn away from the clutches of a wild beast. So God's question, should I accept that from your hand? Of course it's rhetorical. He doesn't even deserve such an answer because God will not accept the reject of man. So not only are the priests responsible, but laymen who are involved in this deception, who are bringing illegitimate sacrifices, those lay people are guilty too. You know, it's easy to blame the preacher because there's no... Um, fire of anointing in the services. I need to remind you that the Holy Spirit comes to church with us. So if there's no fire in the service, we need to check and see how much is burning within us. So the laymen are responsible too. Now, it's possible, again, sometimes Bible scholars and, and historians and people who study the culture think things might be true, but the Bible doesn't make it clear. Some believe that the law always makes it clear that an unblemished male animal is to be offered. Some suggest that not only were the sacrifices blemished, but possibly female animals as well, which would have been a, a double violation there, to say nothing of the disrespect to God in general. So either way, whether that's true or not, an inferior offering was being brought and presented before the Lord, and it was a heinous crime. It was a terrible deception. It was an overt violation of the law. It was an affront to the sovereignty of God. So over and over and over, we're going to see Malachi emphasize this sovereignty of God and that he knows and that he should not be treated with the kind of respect that he was receiving. Okay, if you just think about chapter 1, Malachi presents God as Father and Master. That's in verse 6. In verses 7 and 8, he compares him to an earthly governor, so that suggests that he's the heavenly governor or ruler, and by default, above all earthly authorities. In verse 14, he's compared to the great king. In fact, he is the great king. And because he hates sin, his sovereignty should have caused these people to be reverent before him, but they were indifferent and sinful instead, which put them at risk of the judgment of a holy God. And they are still arguing the point as if they are innocent and have done nothing wrong. Wow. It reminds me of people today who go along their merry way living in overt sin and acting like God will wink at it or if he doesn't wink at it, that they have plenty of time and that there's no reason to be concerned and they'll live their lives the way they want to and maybe they might, just, might decide to be religious when they're old. Be careful because God is not only sovereign, he's holy and he deserves our best. Okay, let's go to chapter two before my time gets away from me. And I certainly want to get into the continuation of this because Malachi is not finished with those priests yet. 
even though that's not the only point he's going to make in this short book, he certainly hasn't finished what he wants to do with this point. I want to read the first nine verses of Malachi chapter 2. And now, O priest, this commandment is for you. Heads up. If you will not hear, and if you will not take it to heart, to give glory to my name, says the Lord of hosts, I will send a curse upon you, and I will curse your blessings. Yes, I have cursed them already, because you do not take it to heart. Behold, I will rebuke your descendants and spread refuse, some versions say dung, on your faces. The refuse of your solemn feasts, and one will take you away with it. Then you shall know that I have sent this commandment to you, that my covenant with Levi may continue, says the Lord of hosts. My covenant was with him, one of life and peace, and I gave them to him that he might fear me. So he feared me and was reverent before my name. The law of truth was in his mouth. And injustice was not found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and equity and turned many away from iniquity. For the lips of a priest should keep knowledge and people should seek the law from his mouth. For he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. But you have departed from the way. You have caused many to stumble at the law. You have corrupted the covenant of Levi, says the Lord of hosts. Therefore, I also have made you contemptible and base before all the people, because you have not kept my ways, but have shown partiality in the law. Woo, that was straight. Now, did you notice verse 1, chapter 2, it says that, God has a commandment for the priest. Now, truthfully, there was a, a double prong here. He wants them to repent, but there's a threat because even though he's a God of mercy and grace and he allows a space for repentance, if they don't repent, repercussions are going to follow. Okay, one of the responsibilities of these priests was to pray God's blessings on the people. You remember the blessing of Aaron? The Lord bless you and keep you, make his face shine on you. The, the priest blessed the people. That was one of the responsibilities. But because these priests have corrupted the ministry that God has given them, their blessings have become useless curses. Curses on the people and curses on themselves. So they are not honoring God. They are not proclaiming his message. Did you hear it? Knowledge of the law should come from the lips of the priest. They're not doing that. They've literally disgraced God and the position they hold by living ungodly lives. Because of that, God intended to publicly disgrace them and to curse their ministry. Now, what do you mean he intended to publicly disgrace them? He seems to indicate that his heavy hand of judgment has already started to fall on the priest. Did you hear him say that he would curse? In fact, he already had cursed. Verse 3 actually suggests that the curse will have a generational impact, that they will lose their heirs after them. Listen to the first three verses in the English Standard Version. Uh, the wording is a little more modern, but I just want you to hear it again. And now, O priest, this command is for you. If you will not listen, if you will not take it to heart and give honor to my name, says the Lord of hosts, then I will send the curse upon you and I will curse your blessings. Indeed, I have already cursed them. There it is. Because you do not lay it to heart. Behold, I will rebuke your offspring and spread dung on your faces. The dung of your offerings 
and you shall be taken away with it. Woo. Now, figuratively, figuratively, God is saying, look, priests, I'm going to tie your hands. I, you can officiate at the temple altar, but you, there won't be any fruit for your labor and nothing good will come from it. I, God will refuse to accept all that multitude of sacrifices that are offered at festival and feast times. And he, above and beyond that, would assign the most disgraceful and shaming treatment of the priests that could have been imagined in that day and culture. The reference to spreading dung on their faces is metaphorical. They're not literally going to do that, but it means that God has contempt for them and that he's going to treat the priests with contempt because they didn't honor God. You didn't honor me as my priests. I'm going to make sure that there is no honor for you and that you are treated publicly in a contemptible way. In fact, God is basically saying, look, um, the ultimate end for you is going to be comparable to the garbage heap. Now, unless they repent, that's clearly where they are headed. God, I, I hesitate to say it, it has always been made clear that those who teach others are held to a higher standard. And that's a scary thought for me. James chapter 3 verse 1 makes it clear. You can't teach others and not love God yourself. You can't teach others and blatantly ignore the, the character and conduct standards of the Lord. You can't teach others if you don't know the word yourself. You need to practice what you preach. So nothing that God expected from these priests had been happening. You know, even in modern times, we know that God gives people a space to repent. But if they don't repent, he ends up exposing them. And they're publicly shamed. It, it's equivalent in some ways, isn't it? So God wanted these priests to come to their senses. He wanted them to mend their ways. He wanted it to be possible for them to continue according to the covenant that had originally been made with Levi. Now, this passage makes it clear that Levi did what God expected. And so you see this reference to Levi and to his immediate descendants as an idea that God had a standard and he wants you to see what that standard is, priests, and you're not meeting that standard. Numbers 25, verses 12 and 13. Levi's being discussed here. Therefore say, behold, I'm giving him my covenant of peace. Did you pick up the references to peace and, and a blessed life that were shared in this passage in regard to Levi? So God says, I'm making a priestly covenant with Levi, and it's going to be a covenant of peace, and it shall be for him and for his descendants after him a covenant of permanent priesthood because he was jealous for his God and made atonement for the sons of Israel. Do you remember that when the children of Israel sinned at the base of, of Sinai, Moses went up to get the law, and I, I always laugh. It's, it's not funny, ha-ha, it's ridiculous, ha-ha. That Aaron threw gold into a fire and a calf came out. And so the people sin, almost having an orgy at the base of a mountain where God's holy presence is. And you remember that Moses wanted to know who was on God's side and the descendants of Levi stepped up, an instrument of destruction against the wickedness the people had stepped into. God clearly 
had a plan for and a respect for those descendants of Levi. Made a covenant with them. Go to Deuteronomy 33, verses 8 through 11. Of Levi, he said, Let your Thummim and your Urim belong to your godly man, whom you tested at Massa, with whom you contended at the waters of Meribah, who said of his father and his mother, I did not consider them. And he did not acknowledge his brothers, nor did he regard his own sons, for they kept your word and complied with your covenant. They will teach your ordinances to Jacob, meaning Israel, and your law to Israel. They shall put incense before you and hold burnt offerings on your altar. Lord, bless his strength and accept the work of his hands. Smash the hips of those who rise against him and those who hate him, so that they shall not rise again. It's clear. Okay, give the, the means of making decisions, the, the responsibility to offer incense and sacrifice to these descendants of Levi, and then let those descendants be blessed. Now, God, God clearly made a covenant and set a standard. And so Malachi is railing on these priests who are so far from this covenant standard that God had set. So through that covenant, acknowledged in verse 5 here, Jehovah had pledged to bestow life and peace on those priests, in turn, they were obligated to serve him and to do it with reverence, to do it in obedience. And so speaking for God, Malachi goes on to say, look, there were priests in the lineage of Levi who faithfully presented the righteous revelation of God, who taught the truth, who lived right, whose hearts were right, and they walked with God, not just in word, but also in deed. And many were turned to righteousness because of them. Now that's throughout scripture. There's this idea. We don't have control, but we do have influence. And when we use that influence for good, we can be a factor in leading others to a relationship with God, in being a means of having them receive the righteousness of Christ in their lives. Uh, Daniel 12, 3, and those who have insight will shine like the glow of the expanse of heaven and those who lead the many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. But what about those who, lo who lose that blessing because they use their influence for unrighteousness? Spiritual leaders who are not right are going to reproduce what they are. They're going to lead others astray. So the priests were to live and speak the truth like the sons of Levi originally had done. That was critically important since the primary function of the priest was to instruct according to moral law. That's in verse 7. They were appointed by God. So at least in part, they should teach a knowledge of God and a recognition of his will according to the law because God has always worked based on the degree of revelation of him the people had. Did you notice that the priests were called the messenger of the Lord of hosts? Isn't that interesting? You remember that Malachi means my messenger? And we're going to run into that concept again in this study. May not get to it today, but it's going to show up next time in, in another sense of usage. So in some Old Testament passages, lots of them in fact, the expression apparently refers to a messenger who's probably a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ. We know that happened some. And so this idea of being a messenger for God has different levels, but there is always a level of expectation that goes with it. So there's no higher honor 
that could have been bestowed on them as a human priest than to have words like those words used in reference to them that these priests were to be the messengers of God. Unfortunately, because they're not turning people to righteousness, because their influence is for evil and not for good, what's coming from them is corrupted, both in words and by example. So the law in their case is corrupted and they are leading men astray because they've nullified the, the covenant that God made with the descendants of Levi, and they've nullified it by their actions. Now, verse 9 makes it really clear that the priest did not have the respect of the people at all, and the people participated in the same sins the priest participated in. And on top of everything else, the priests are showing partiality and preference to the people who are, I suppose, rich and powerful, influential. Now, that's a problem. Let me refer you to Micah 3.11. And it says, its heads give judgment for what? For a bribe. Its priests teach for a price. Now, what does that mean? I mean, they're teaching according to what benefits them and makes them popular, and I guess they're winning friends and influencing people. And so Micah's message is very similar to what Malachi is saying here. Let me, re let me restart because I kept interrupting myself. Its heads give judgment for a bribe. Its, bribe, its priests teach for a price. Its prophets practice divination for money. Yet they lean on the Lord and say, Is not the Lord in the midst of us? No disaster shall come upon us. Oh my goodness. Micah is describing circumstances so similar to what Malachi has described. Notice bribes and, and priests that can be bought. The suggestion is almost that they're teaching to itching ears. Now that should sound familiar to us. And it apparently was a problem then. And guess what? It's still a problem today. Second Timothy 4, 3. For the time will come when they will not tolerate sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance with their own desires. Meaning, if a teacher teaches it like you want to live it, even though it's not what the Word says, you gravitate toward the teacher who is peddling a soft soap version of the gospel. Well, so these priests, the ones Micah talks about, the ones Malachi talks about, ignore their sins before God, don't warn the people to turn from their wicked ways either. And on top of that, they're showing favoritism to the wealthy and powerful. And then those rich and powerful people are taking advantage of other people as well. Domino effect. Now, ministers today, don't care if you're a police priest of the house of Levi or a person who is leading as an under-shepherd a, a portion of the body of Christ, the flock. You should exemplify godly character. You should show love and respect for God. You should live an honest life according to God's standards. You should preach the absolute undiluted truth of God and lead by example. Now, if that's done, the effect will be that people will turn away from sin and toward God. You notice you can't turn to God without turning away from sin. Another truth behind that, pastors, evangelists, ministry leaders, teachers, whoever you are, must teach or preach all the Word of God to the people who are under your care because you're responsible. Acts 20, 27. For I did not shrink 
from declaring to you the whole purpose of God. Faithful ministers understand that you love your people. You don't fleece sheep for the fun of fleecing sheep, and you don't shear them either. So you're not out to take advantage of sheep. You're not out to berate them just because you think you hold a position over them. But, oh my goodness, we have to teach the truth. Even the things that are hard for people to hear, the things that people don't want to hear, don't want to face, and probably want to pretend they don't understand. Not just the things that bring joy and gladness to people and make preachers and teachers popular. That's not how it works. We simply must teach, preach, the truth. So that's going to make it necessary to talk about the tough challenges God issues, the stern warnings of Scripture, the fact that one day judgment is going to come to those who don't get right and stay right with God. Thank God for every comforting promise that we find in the Word of God. Thank God for the benefits we have in belonging to Him, not just in eternity in heaven, but oh my goodness, I would not want to face the challenges of this life without Him. Just think about salvation that we get through grace, by faith, not of works, because we could never earn it. Just think about the blessings that God has bestowed on us. So yes, we teach that Jesus Christ saves, that He's a merciful and a kind Savior, that God is a loving God, but He's also a just God. He's also a holy God. And one day, as a teacher or a preacher, I believe we will stand before God. There actually is a pecking order. I believe every one of us will give account for what we have taught and modeled for our family. Then I believe we will be responsible for the amount of influence God has given us over other people, especially if you teach or preach. And then I also think that every one of us lay people, whoever we are, will give account for what we did with the opportunities that were presented to us. Yes, the Bible teaches that we don't all have the same number of talents or gifts or opportunities, but we all have some, and we are responsible for what we do. Just as Malachi rails on these priests and on these lay people who don't have hearts of true worship for God, just so one day God's going to look to see if what's here is sincere and pure. He's going to look and see what we've done and whether or not it's wood, hay, and stubble because the motives weren't pure or whether we have loved and served Him to the best of our ability with our whole heart, leading by example, because if words and deeds don't match, people will pay attention to what we do as a reflection of what we are. Well, I'm just going to tell you that Malachi is going to continue and a series of questions that are very thought-provoking will begin this next section. And I hope that you will be able to come back and be with me for that next time. Again, I know there's a heaviness to some of this content, but it is the Word of the Lord, and it is still, in essence, relevant for us today. Thank God it is tempered by grace, the grace that we have received through Jesus Christ. And I pray that you will walk sincerely, humbly, and in honesty and devoted service with a sincere heart of worship before your God until we are back together again next time. And I hope you'll join me then. God bless.